Really pleased to be joined today by Mary Jean Eisenhower. Um, as uh, Joy mentioned a moment ago, we are exploring um, Eisenhower's legacy of leadership through different aspects of his life. And what better way to start off this year and this amazing topic than with Mary Jean Eisenhower? Um, she's a great friend of mine, and she has studied her grant her great grandmother. I almost missed a generation there, Mary Jean. Um, and she would like to tell us more about this amazing, magnificent woman. Um, so Mary Jean, if you're ready, would you like to just jump right on in or do you have something you'd like to start with? Um, yes. First of all, thank you all for, for coming. Um, it, it's very special to me to um, share about Ida because in, in my various researches and, and of course, being around uh, her uh, stomping grounds, if you will, um, both in Virginia and here, um, I've just absolutely fallen in love with her posthumously, and I now understand why we're not speaking German in this country. Um, granddad's, uh, oh, and I also wanted to say, I understand my sister, Anne, uh, is joining us, and I I want to give her a, a big shout out. It's, it's her great grandmother, too. So hi, Anne, and thanks for coming. Welcome, Anne. Can't wait to, can't wait to hear. <laughs> Um, gently in manner, strongly indeed, is kind of granddad's, if you will, tagline. But I am sure that's inherited. Um, his his mother uh, is an extremely interesting character, um, but she was very gently in manner, strongly indeed. Um, she was born in Mount Sydney, Virginia on a plantation um, in one of the outside buildings, not in the, not in the large house. Her grandfather owned the large house. Um, and she was the youngest of uh, six, five brothers, her senior. And the thing that started to define her life um, uh, from day one, and she remembered it, even though she was only two years old during uh, this particular time, this is during the Civil War, but she remembered it vividly and even told my father about it, and he, he shared it with me. Um, but she was very close to her brother, William, who was the oldest. He was 15 at the time. And um, they, they were kind of um, almost, almost generational siblings. Um, and uh, they were having a normal morning one morning, you know, everybody was getting ready to do what they do for the day. And uh, she and William were horsing around and um, uh, these men in uniforms and, and, and with shackles and that kind of thing came and seized William out of the house uh, and put him in a, a prisoner of war camp called Lookout. Um, but it, it, it traumatized Ida to the point where she remembered that the rest of her life. Um, and I believe it defined kind of her shape and she in turn defined other shapes because of that experience. Um, she was a, an extreme pacifist, um, very religious and had, um, uh, let me put it this way, if it needed to get done, it would get done. She and her mother were the only two ladies of the house, if you will. So they, they did all the domestic things. And um, her mother died, though, uh, when she was five years old. And her father, in turn, remarried a woman who had uh, four sons. And then they had a daughter together. Well, you fast forward another few years and her father died. Well, the stepmother took her half sister and her step siblings with her and left. And so she was left as the, the sole um, little girl or whatever. And she ended up living with her grandfather 
in the plantation home. Um, and he wanted, you know, she, she was in school and loved, she was very curious and, and loved her education. Um, and he wanted her to quit her education and become kind of a Southern bell type. Um, you know, just learn the, um, the basic things and how to be a lady and that kind of thing. And she did not want to, to quit school um, and to prove herself education worthy. She memorized 1700 Bible verses. She had a verse for every occasion and she was trying to prove herself educational worthy to her grandfather and he still wanted her to quit school. So upset, she, she ran away from home. She was 15 years old. Well, meanwhile, you have a little drama going on in the church. Um, uh, she had uh, some problems with some people who were, let's, let's say, not very nice. And so she decided to... Um, quit that church, but she started a ref at 15 years old, she started a reformed um, Lutheran church, uh, kind of a sister church, a couple miles away from the one that she had attended all of her life, um, which I think is quite remarkable. And she, she lived with the family and um, helped them take care of the house and their child um, for room and board so she could finish high school. When she finished high school, um, she taught at the school. Um, until she was 21. Mary Jean. She, yes. I'm sorry. Didn't you have some photos you could share from this time period as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, Samantha, can you share those, please? Well, there she is in her latter years, <laughs> and there she, uh, that's from the um, directory at uh, Salem Lutheran Church, her original church, and I, it was a commemorative uh, directory because she was only 15 when she quit the, the church, but um, you, can, you can tell by that picture, she's obviously older than 15, so I think they went back and just found a, another picture for the directory. Um, and yeah, and this is her um, wedding picture um, uh, on her license uh, with with David, and I'll get to that part of it in in just a little bit. But that's what that picture is. Then the next one. That's um, her grandfather's grave that is in Mount Sydney, and that was uh, originally part of the whole plantation, which has, of course, been uh, divided up since. Um, but it's, it's oh, as they say in the South, a spit's throw from, from uh, the main house. Um, and her, her parents are buried there, too, but their um, stones were almost unreadable. Um, you know, let's see if I can do something about that at some point. So, Mary Jean, is there a specific slide you'd like me to jump forward to? Um, maybe, maybe her church one. Yeah, this, this is the Salem of uh, Evangelical uh, Lutheran Church, which Ida was a member of uh, for a long time. Uh, well, because she was 15. And the church has not changed um, on the inside much. I probably needed a, a different um, angle, too, to show you where the choir sat and that kind of thing. But I, I have attended that church uh, three times now, trying to kind of get a feel for what it was like when she was in it. Um, they uh, obviously remember her. She's in the directory. Um, and it was kind of funny. Um, the minister introduced me at one point and said that uh, my great grandmother had been a, a member uh, and then she moved to Kansas and married Dwight Eisenhower. And I said, well, eh, not quite, not, not quite that, that way. But anyway, uh, they, they have it on, they have it correctly on record. It, that was just uh, the minister not knowing what he's talking about. Um, and I guess, is there another, or, or the, the link house, right? Yeah, that is a picture of the big house. 
um, that was uh, Grandpa Link's house, and Ida lived there um, from age nine to 15. Uh, her birth house is uh, across the, the street and down a hill and kind of up another hill. And um, uh, I don't have a picture of the outside of that one. Uh, I do, but it's buried somewhere. And then that's the side of the house. I was just trying to show the depth of the house because it doesn't look very big from the front, but it is a large house. Okay, so we've learned. Th oh, I'm and sorry. Th oh, that's okay. This is um, actually the schoolhouse where she taught after she graduated high school. Uh, as you can see, it's now being used as a shed, but that, that is the actual building she taught in. Hmm. So she clearly had a deep, spiritual religious component to her um she clearly believed greatly in education yes. um how do you think those two topics played a role in the formation of not just dwight her son but the rest of her sons as well well um it's interesting i think i think in a way um it also is what brought her and david together because um, she um, got a modest inheritance from her father uh, when she was 21, and she found William in Topeka. So she went after her brother, William, in Topeka and enrolled uh, in a place that would uh, take women um, called Lane University. And here's, here's a picture of the building, and it still stands today, looks exactly the same. Um, I believe it closed down in like 1908, but that's where David and Ida met. And they had their study in common and they had their um, religion in common. Um, and I think it had attracted them to each other. And she ended up um, converting to um, uh, River Brethren when she got with, with David. And in turn, um, they as a family after the kids were born and they were growing up and that kind of thing uh, had evening uh, Bible readings and that kind of thing. And uh, one thing that she emphasized, you know, of course they had no money. And one thing she emphasized to her sons was that the only way that they were going to get out of this um, was, uh, you know, through education and, she was an extreme pacifist, uh, largely because of what she went through and, uh, you know, as a, as a child, but also, you know, because of her faith and it all just kind of evolved. And the River Brethren are recognized um, conscientious object, objectors and that kind of thing. But she was also very fair-minded and practical. And uh, Granddad and Edgar, his brother, um, made a deal that um, they would work and put each other through um, college. Well, granddad did work and put Edgar through, but Edgar couldn't co come through for granddad when his turn came. So granddad at 21, um, uh, at 21 uh, applied to the US Naval Academy. This is kind of an historic moment uh, for the free education. And his mother was aghast but um, she did not stand in his way. You know, she felt it was more important for him to get the education and, and lift himself out of the poverty that they were in. Um, he was too old for Annapolis, so he um, reapplied, he was turned down and he applied to West Point and he was accepted at West Point. So, you know, there's another, you know, aha historic moment that could have, you know, changed everything. Um, but she said to him, um, the Lord deals you your cards, how you play them is up to you, which, um, was very selfless of her because it, it really kind of, you know, quietly, and she was not a complainer. She was a very positive person, but inside it, 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 it broke her heart in a way that he was going military. I think later on. That also may have taught her taught that also may have taught them to, um, you know, find their own destiny. 
Did Mary, Mary Jean pop out again? Um, it, it shows that her screen is frozen. Mary Jean, you are frozen. Well, um, Samantha, can you show us that wonderful family photo again while, while Mary Jean's internet reconnects? So here is the family. Um, and one of the stories that Mary Jean wanted to talk to us about was um, uh, the Bloody Fist story um, where Ike got so upset with something that he went out and punched some trees. Um, and I really don't want to tell this story. I really want Mary Jean to tell it for us. <laughs> Maybe we can have a question while we're waiting. I'm going to text her. Anne, would you like to tell us a family story? Where do I begin? <laughs> do you want to tell the frozen fist story? I mean, the frozen fist, the um, bloody fist story? Uh, I'm not sure I know it. That's why I'm right. here today. I'm here to learn. Well, then we'll try to wait for your sister. I don't know what's going on with her internet today. It's usually very steady. Okay, I'm, I'm here. There you here. are. Okay. Welcome back, Mary Jean. <laughs> Thank you. Remind me to cancel AT&T. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. what I was saying was that perhaps uh, we can put that picture up of the family again, and you can tell us some of the family stories that, that developed Eisenhower's um, leadership skills. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, we have the. We started talking about the bloody fist story, but I didn't want to take it away from you. Oh, um, yeah. Well, at one point, uh, Granddad uh, lost his his temper. Uh, I guess David, he and David got into some kind of argument. Uh, I think it was Halloween. I'm not positive about this, uh, but I think it was Halloween, and he went and he he literally uh, beat up a tree, and um, it caused him to have um, you know, bloody knuckles and, uh, Ida, uh, he said one of his most, um, touching moments was when Ida was salving, uh, his bloody knuckles. And, you know, she was saying, was it worth losing your temper over and, you know, kind of giving him, uh, coaching on, on self-control. But another thing that was kind of interesting, he had a bad year that year and he, um, scraped his um, shin on uh, a tree that he, I guess he was climbing or something. Um, and Ida, uh, having college under her belt, she, she, they couldn't afford doctors. So she kept a, a medical encyclopedia uh, at the house. And when something went wrong with one of the boys, she treated them herself, including um, Roy had a farming accident and, uh, put his eye out and she put a glass eye on her own son's head. I don't know how she did it. I don't either. Um, back to the, um, the, the leg story, um, streaks started coming up from the, from the wound and I would recognized it as blood poisoning. And she said, well, this is past me. I have to get a doctor. So she brought a doctor in and the doctor said, well, the leg's going to have to come off. And he said, no, he'd rather die than lose his leg. And he locked himself in a downstairs bedroom and his brother, uh, Edgar, held vigil uh, at the door. You know, he was he was guarding it so nobody could get in. And uh, sure enough, granddad stayed in there for three days and he literally sweated it out and survived. Another moment that would have changed history had that leg come off. Mm -hmm. so, um, but he was 10 years old when that happened. And that's a lot of fortitude for a 10 year old. But um uh, you know, and, and Ida did not run interference with that. I, I know it was against her better judgment and that kind of thing, but she was letting him do what he needed to do just the same way she kind of did herself. Now, she gave birth to seven sons. One died of diphtheria, Paul, uh, at age eight months. He was um, just behind granddad in the line. He was the fourth child. And um so by the time she got to Milton, her seventh boy, um, she really 
wanted a girl. And as you can see in this portrait, there's a sweet looking girl between her and David, uh, but that's actually Milton. And, um, you know, the explanation has been, well, that was very common for um, Victorian people to um, dress their boys in, in curls and dresses. And my answer to that is she was not Victorian and she didn't do it to any of the other boys. So you can imagine with all those boys in the house, you know, how, shall we say, male dominated the house was. And, um, you know, they, they were kind of, you know, they were embarrassed by Milton. They were, they called him a, a basic, you know, they felt like he was a sissy. And um, so on Saturdays, Edgar and, Granddad, uh, Ike, would um, sell Ida's vegetables at the farmer's market, um, you know, to help supplement the family income. And one Saturday, uh, Ida had something she needed to do, and she had Milton looking like he looks in that, that picture on her hip. And she went up to the boys and said, um, you guys are going to have to, you were going to have to take uh, the baby because I've got something I have to do and I have to do it alone. And there was an argument, but of course I had a one. Um, and so they reluctantly popped Milton on front of, you know, on the front of the, the vegetable cart and they, you know, wheeled him into the farmer's market and they discovered something. And that was that, you know, the, the housewives and that kind of thing, came over and said, oh my gosh, what a beautiful baby. And they were buying while they were admiring the baby. So Milton became a marketing tool. He was a regular every Saturday after that and he helped sales go up. So smart, um, smart fellows. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned uh, President Eisenhower's um, 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 known bad temper or, or, or short temper. Um, did you ever experience that with him? I know he was your granddad, and so the relationship's different, but did you ever witness his short temper? I saw it twice uh, that I can, I mean, that I can vividly remember. I um, sure did. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you probably remember when he lost his temper at the farm when Khrushchev visited. That I, that I don't remember. I remember the horses going over the putting green. Oh. I remember seeing him dress down somebody once upon a time brilliantly. Um, but, it, you know, it, it was it was not myth. Yeah, yeah. Um, he kept it in check most of the time, but, it, you know, he kind of had that that little button when the when the steam hit, it hit. And uh, I, I think that was I think his father didn't keep it in check. You know what I mean? I think it's the same kind of streak, but. Um, you know, granddad was, uh, learned to be very, very patient, but, you know, something was just flat dead wrong and, and yeah. Well, it, it was known that, um, and very true, that if he was upset and about to blow, uh, he'd just walk out of a room. And, every, and that was worse than him getting mad when he walked out of a room because everybody knew it was really serious. Well, you know, there's kind of a people to people story about that. Um, he had uh, resurrected a, a ship that had been a naval ship that had been mothballed to be uh, Project Hope, which was um, it was converted into a surgical hospital, went around to developing nations um, to uh, perform surgeries and such like that. Well, when it was in the planning stage, um, you know, granddad asked about it and they said, yeah, there's there's a perfectly good retired naval ship. Um, and he said, okay, well, let's get it for Project Hope then. You know, it was part of the people to people program. And um, so they, they met the next quarter, like they always did. And he asked the status of it. Well, they hadn't done anything on it. It was in the water and converted that week. <laughs> you know, you never oh, display this. Yeah temper but behind the scenes you know it got done he he could not believe that it that they hadn't done anything on it so so what about um 
What about the topic of the family had all boys and no girls? Did Ida impart anything to to the boys about um, maybe gender issues or division of labor? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say division of labor. I don't think gender was an issue in those days. Um, not an open one anyway. Um, she taught, you know, obviously she had a load because uh, David had an interesting relationship with employment. So it was really kind of up to Ida to keep the family together and to keep the various sources of revenue going. And, uh, you know, she was tilling soil and she was, um, she was also managing the money and she was also, um, you know, raising the boys and all that. So she taught um, each of the boys how to sew, cook, and clean. And she tried the piano, which went over with Milton, but not, not with granddad so, so much. But uh, they all knew how to uh, sew, cook, and clean. And in fact, um, my grandmother could have burned water, but granddad was a really, really good cook. So it, it, um, uh, he loved it. He really enjoyed it. And, you know, that was traditionally the woman's work or whatever. And um, I never saw him sew, so I don't know anything about that. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of his creative parts came out and like painting and things like that. But um, so she she taught them that, you know, all work was honest work. And uh, even and she herself decided she needed a day off and that would be Sundays. So she would take, um, you know, they would all go to church and uh, two they rotated two of the sons would have to skip Sunday school after church and go home and cook the um, the family meal because that was her day off. So, yeah, I, I think that um, the traditional role playing and that kind of thing, she kind of smoothed over because, you know, she had to. And what was the importance? I'm sorry, what was that? So I can ask you a question? Absolutely. Uh, in most of the biographies, one has the sense that his mother had a greater impact on him than his father. Is that the sense you have? Uh, absolutely. Um, he called her, quote unquote, saintly. He um, absolutely adored her. And uh, in fact, um, in many ways, he, he um, honored her without, without words, if, if you will. Um, there are several examples that come to mind. Um, at Ida's birthplace, I, you know, when I first saw it, I, I didn't know. I thought, well, I wonder if granddad's ever been here. And the owners, the current owner said, have you seen the plaque? And I said, what plaque? It was out in the yard. And I went and read it. And what he had done, he was sitting president and he, he had given um, remarks at graduation for um, Stanford. Uh, I think I've got the wrong name. I did that before. But anyway, uh, a military school nearby. Um, Staunton. Staunton, thank Mary. It's, yes, thank you. I, I, I don't know why I, I always do that with that particular name. Anyway, um, so um, afterwards, there was a premeditated private visit to the birthplace where he took soil from Denison and soil from where he was born and soil from uh, Kansas where she died and um, mixed it in the soil uh, in the yard, her birthplace and um, planted a tree uh, calling it the Liberty tree. And the only people that knew he was there were the, the owners of the house and, and the secret service. And he went back to Washington, DC. This is 1960, he goes back to Washington, DC and he had a plaque made up saying what it was and sent it back to the house. The plaque is still there. The tree is not. Um, so that was one incident. And I used to think he was kind of prophetic because he started people to people a peace organization on September 11th, uh, 1956. Well, it turns out that that was actually the 10th anniversary of Ida's death. Um, so I'm guessing that it was more in honor of her <laughs> rather than just a, a coincidental date. And um, 
the opening of the library, uh, May 2nd, 1962, was on uh, Ida's 100th anniversary. So um, he, he honored her in many ways uh, that were, were subtle, but um, I do know that he cherished and adored her. Would you like to talk about how Kansas honored her? Yeah. Um, right after the war in uh, 1947, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, 46, because, uh, 45, because she died in 46, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 45, uh, Kansas, obviously, you know, the, the war just ended and Kansas uh, honored her with uh, Kansas Mother of the Year. And um, it, it was kind of cute because uh, the press, you know, went all over. They were all over what we now know as the boyhood home. And uh, they were trying to get sound bites and stuff from her. And they said, what do you think about your remarkable son? And she said, which one? <laughs> so that, that's a good mother. But, you know, in, in a way, she, she was absolutely right. I mean, granddad was granddad, but... Um, you know, all the boys were uh, very successful in their own in their own way, and I believe that it was her example and her motivation. That's a picture of um, my father and um, grandfather with her, and I'm not. Yeah, okay. Uh, that was that when the uh, award was given. Yeah, okay. So, look at how sweetly they're looking at each other. I just love that picture. Well, we like to mention at the library, we like to mention that Eisenhower wrote that his mother was the emotional heart of the home, as opposed yeah. to his father. His father's role, he wrote, was as judge, jury, and Lord High Executioner. Yeah. Maybe you can talk about the dichotomy of his parents to him? Yeah, well, it, it was kind of interesting because um, the boys, at least according to my research, and I don't know... Um, you know, I've been doing paper research because there's so many different versions of different things that have happened, but they almost had to do damage control on, on what they wanted their father's legacy to be. Um, he, you know, for example, um, uh, when they left Hope, Kansas, um, you know, they had a general store in uh, Hope, Kansas, on what was left of Ida's small inheritance um, from her father. And it was mismanaged and, and it went bankrupt and all that. And he, he left Ida pregnant with two, uh, two here and she was pregnant with granddad and he went to Denison. And th the official story was uh, to be a train engineer because engineering was his field of study, but it was really to, to clean the wheels of the engines so it was it, anyway, um, she, you know, said nuts to that basically. And somehow with no money, got the two walking boys and the one in the oven and went to Denison and ran them down. And uh, they ended up living at what's now known as the birthplace um, on the first floor and they didn't have any money for rent. So they rented out the second floor. So they spent most of their married life living in two rooms. Um, uh, even when the, when the boys got up to like six years old, I, I'm sorry, six, uh, the number six, um, and, until they moved into uh, what we now know as the boyhood home. Uh, and Ida, Ida's reaction was finally, I'll have enough space, you know, cause they had two bedrooms upstairs and one downstairs. Um, I'll have enough space to uh, raise my boys. And granddad wrote about it and said, you know, it was like, it was literally like moving into a mansion because the original house in Abilene um, that granddad lived in until he was nine years old um, is about a block and a half away from what's now the boyhood home. And it was two rooms, you know, everybody slept in one and everybody lived in one. You know, and that's the way they lived in Denison, too. And um, Ida's dream was always to have, um, you know, enough space to raise her boys. And uh, she achieved all of, you know, despite her poverty and, 
um, challenges and that kind of thing. She achieved all of her dreams. It, it was, you know, miniature in comparison to some dreams, but um, they, they, she, she accomplished her goals and, and did it well. And with no complaining, I mean, she just, she just picked up and carried on all the time. So the last question that I have to you before we turn it back to Joy to open it up for a chat um, okay. would be, uh, you, we've already discussed this, that our overarching theme is the making of a leader. And we're starting with Ida because Ida, we're, our thesis is that Ida created the foundation and the framework for what this man would become. So as, as, as her relative um, and her scholar, what do you think she imparted, instilled in him that made him become the man that we needed when we needed him? Well, I, you know, one significant thing that, um, you know, in, in trying to keep his um, legacy alive, and I think my sister would agree with me on this, um, uh, he was so humble, you know, that he didn't self-promote and that kind of thing. So it, 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 it makes you dig for information on some of the things, you know, like he was considered a do-nothing president until his papers declassified, and then everybody's going, oh, my God, you know, um, but she, she basically, or, you know, his, his idea was it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as it gets done. Well, that's exactly the way she was. You know, she, she had the, the lace collars and uh, she did her quilting and she did all kinds of women's stuff. And, you know, she, she um, obeyed her husband, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, but meanwhile, she's, teaching all these skills and uh, the ability to get along under all circumstances to the boys. And I, I really think that her influence um, and her ability to teach them how to accept people, you know, kind of like how, how the Lord deals with your cards, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I, I believe that that had an influence on, um, how granddad uh, was able to get along with all the, the allies, you know, they were all type A personalities and they were all generals and they were all in charge. And here he comes and he's got to, you know, he's, he's from Abilene, Kansas, and he's, he's going to lead, you know, the Montgomery's and the, and, uh, you know, work very closely with Churchill and, you know, uh, De Gaulle and people like that. And um, he was able to do it. And, and actually, you know, become not only friends, not only friendly, but friends. Well, it seems like he was the only one who got along with De Gaulle. Yeah, he and De Gaulle had a very special relationship. They, they really did. Um, and I guess, you know, it was kind of like um, that cartoon uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the dog and, and, and the wolf or I'm, I'm sorry, the sheep and the wolf. Oh yeah. <clears throat> where they, excuse me, um, where they clock in and mm -hmm. they fight all day long and then they clock out and they, they walk off arm in arm. You know, yeah. that, that was kind of uh, the way he was with Montgomery. In fact, um, I went to um, Greenham Commons and there's a pub there that was there um, during World War II. And uh, this was... Well, 1990. So, you know, it's, it's, um, I doubt they're there now, but the original owners were still there. And uh, they said that uh, Granddad and Montgomery used to go in there and have a beer every night. Well, you know, they, they fought like cats and dogs during the day, <laughs> you know. So, um, anyway, she, she uh, wanted to serve everybody a beer like she did them. <laughs> Aww, that's cute. sweet. Yeah. Well, I would like to ask Joy how she wants to handle the question and answer session. Um, Joy, do you want to moderate that? I can. Um, I don't have a problem doing that. Uh, we'll start with <laughs> questions that are in the chat, and then uh, we'll open up the floor for people to unmute themselves. That will work. Um, so I've removed on as the spotlight, so it's all you, Mary Jean. Uh, but the first question we have is from Stephen, and he asks, can you relate any insight into Ida's involvement in the Pentecostal faith? 
Um, yes and no. That's kind of a that's kind of a, a confusing thing. Um, I know that she had uh, hosted some of their meetings later later in life. Now, she started out a Lutheran and then became one of her brethren. Uh, I understand that she um, either converted or at least um, associated uh, closely with them uh, after David had died. So, you know, later on, later on in life, I, I don't know that she died a member of their church. I think she died still a, a river brethren. But I, I do know that she hosted meetings for them and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see a question from Aaron. It says, you mentioned something about Ike losing his temper with Khrushchev when he was visiting. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, th um, that was the visit that uh, Khrushchev had kind of a bad visit to the United States. That was, that was the one where he was, um, I think it was 1958, where he was pounding his shoe on the podium you know, um, when he was trying to make a point uh, at the UN. I don't know how many people are old enough to remember that. Um, it's also the year they wouldn't let him go to Disneyland. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, he came to the farm. Um, uh, and he and whoever was traveling with him, I think it was Sergei, wasn't it, Ann? It was traveling Not with my knowledge, but uh, I was more focused on Khrushchev than anybody else. <laughs> right, right. Um, and and Granddad and Daddy all went out uh, to the sun porch, which was kind of the crash spot of the family. And we we were in the living room, and Khrushchev had given us some gifts, and Granddad, uh, including uh, Soviet lapel pins, I might add, <laughs> and uh, Granddad came out. Uh, there there were French doors that divided the. Uh, living room from the blast in porch. And um, he came flying through those doors and collected all the gifts and handed them back to him. And, um, you know, we couldn't, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Ian, but we didn't do, we didn't get, we didn't see that side of him like almost never. We, we couldn't do much wrong. We were his grandchildren. He, you know, anyway, uh, long story short, I, I guess we put up enough of a fuss that he, he gave us the dolls back, but um, uh, going home, um, we were still wearing the the lapel pins and it, it uh, caught my mother's eye and she sticks her hand out and made us turn all the lapel pins in and she threw them out into a, a cow pasture. So if there's ever um, an archaeological dig in, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the Soviet lapel pins came from us. <laughs> but um, yeah, he he was very upset because I guess, um, and I'm sure he meant politically, but um, you know, I think on the porch they said something to the effect of, um, "I'll bury your grandchildren alive." No, it wasn't on the porch. It was. Uh, I, I remember it very well because I took yeah. it very personally. Yeah, uh, we just met this man, and he seemed so lovely and like a grandfather type. And yeah. um, a couple of days later, he was in the press saying that uh, he would be bury your oh, grandchildren. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought, oh my God, you know, how could he do that? He was just nice, you know. Yeah, but that was a couple of days later. Okay, and that's an interesting story. <laughs> um, so that's the last question in the chat. Um, so I'm going to go to giving people the option to unmute themselves. However, I will ask uh, for now, if you'll use the hand raise option, and then I will call on you as I see the hands are up. Um, and then, so we can get through that somewhat smoothly, and then I'll give you the opportunity to just unmute. So we do have a hand up and it is Bill Berry. So Mr. Berry, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Is it apocryphal or is it true, back to the Montgomery relationship, that Eisenhower was talking to him about the schedule and Montgomery said the schedule and he responded, I didn't learn it that way in shul. Is that true? 
I don't know. I Andy, love the you know? story. And then this That's particular funny. book, the guy asked about the religious background, Pentecostal. Uh, Merle Miller wrote a book, Ike the Soldier. It has a whole chapter on the religious background of Ida and David and the family. All right, thank okay. you. Now, did you want to respond, Mary Jean? No, I, I, I thank you for the information. That's okay. Right. Now, I saw what looked like the hand clap from Eleanor Higginbotham. So I'm not sure if you meant to yes. raise your hand, but if you did, please unmute. <laughs> yes, yes. My maiden name is Elson, and your my dad baptized your grandfather because of the fact that the River Brethren believed in adult baptism, and he wasn't baptized until he became until af just after he became president. And and I like to think that they had a good relationship. He was very faithful. I sat next to him in church and saw you and your sisters and David when you were little coming to church on Easter, all dressed up and everything, which I'm sure was a struggle for you all. But the story I love is of of the dedication of the Gettysburg. Uh, your grandfather asked my father to to bless it, the Gettysburg home, and and I think in David's book there's a little image of you all sort of kneeling at the coffee table <laughs> or something while my dad said a prayer over the house, which was uh, you know that's the sweetest thing. So, isn't that maybe one of Ida's greatest gifts was that she gave him, as even though he forswore it for years probably. In the end, he came back to the religious background that she was so faithful to. Yeah, I, I believe as uh, president, he uh, converted to Presbyterian. That's right. Definitely. Yeah. He, he had, he had um, you know, been kind of generic, shall we say, as, as an army officer. Um, you know, he either went to the Protestant or the Catholic or the Jewish services. And, you know, so it was all kind of um generic but i i believe that um he became a presbyterian a good then, one but i can i can see why he would uh shall we say um at least embrace her uh you know her religious beliefs and and uh, the river brethren as well um because you know her her demeanor and and her um the, the church's influence on the way she did things um, was something he admired very much. Yes. All right. Well, there are no other hands up. So, um, oh, there we go. Bill Berry, you have another question. Yeah, right. I'd another like to know if I could get uh, emails to connect to either you, Mary Jane, or you, Anne. So we're not uh, we're not going to do that over the internet. Um, if you would like to um, get some information to them, feel free to in, to email the library, and we will forward your email to them. Perfect. So it's Eisenhower library at nara .gov. Thank you, Don. Um, so at this time, I'll give just a minute for anyone who has a question but didn't raise their hand to unmute and ask your question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so Mary Jean, Samantha remembered about um, uh, President Eisenhower being sworn in as the president of the United States um, on the Bible that was given to him at West Point. Right. Um, and he wrote his own, his own prayer. Any comments on that moment of his life? You don't remember that. <laughs> well, the second one, I was like, uh, what, um, two months not old? Not months existent. Old? Right. Uh, Dan would have stories. I wasn't even thought of yet. Do you remember, <laughs> Dan? Well, I mean, the first inauguration, we were all too young. I guess we were all, you know, placed in a cage or something. But uh, <laughs> but uh, second, second one, uh, I was there. David was there. I don't remember seeing pictures of you and Susie there, were you? No, you were too small. No, I, I was in the crib. 
Right. I'm sure that I, I would not to right. keep quiet. And Susie, Susie, I'm not sure I've seen pictures of her there. I'm sure she was. I, I don't think, I don't, I think it was just you and David because that's all I've seen too. So I'm sorry, what was the question? We got distracted here. I was thinking okay. about um, um, him taking the oath of office on the Bible that his parents gave him um, when he graduated from West Point. You know, I, I don't know that. Uh, I'm very bad on history, as many of you know. Um, I, I, do know. I just got too much of it when I was little, and so I blocked everything out. But the <laughs> one thing I do know is that the second inauguration, he was sworn in before the day before. And I remember telling my father that once that I remember the ceremony. And he said, what? And he went back to his records and everything. And he was, he was sworn in on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think it was a Sunday. And the, the um, actual swearing in in front of the public was on, on Monday. Mm -hmm. And uh, which I thought was sort of fascinating. There was some reason for it, timing or you know, whatever. We'll have to investigate that. It is I remember the ceremony in the, um, in the East Room of the White House. That is correct. And, and I've done a deep dive into all that history. Oh, and right. yeah, Psalm 3312 from his mother's <laughs> gifted Bible. I've got a picture of it from the library by Chris Abraham sent it to me. And uh, fascinating history. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so if we don't have any other questions or comments, then we are going to wrap it up. I want to Mary say Jean. thank you. Oops, sorry. Yes. Mary, Mary Jean, this is Jerry Winter. Oh, hey, Jerry. How are you? How are you? Good to see you again. Oh, my gosh. It's, yeah, it's great to hear you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Yeah. I just wanted to make a note. Uh, the Stover is one of our cousins. <laughs> they're very distant cousins. <laughs> We're up yeah. in Minnesota. Uh, coming out of Pennsylvania, when my side of the Eisenhower family came out, uh, the Stovers were involved very much as ministers to the Eisenhower family, at least my branch. Uh, my fourth great-grandfather, John Martin Eisenhower, and my third great-grandfather, John D. Eisenhower, were both married by Stover ministers. Do you oh, think that great. had any play or have you had any study or background into the Stovers and the ministry that they provided to the families of that Actually, era? I, I didn't, but um, uh, Abraham Lincoln Eisenhower was an evangelic on the road. He, he had been a veterinarian and had a very successful business uh, actually here in Abilene. And he took to the road, um, you know, with the with the uh, the wagon and everything else. And and um, I guess, yeah, he he would have been the Stover's grandchild, or yeah, grandchild, or maybe a nephew or something like that. But that's that's the extent of what I know about uh, the Stovers and their ministry. I know he was he was uh, it was his life. He he. Um, gave up a very socially uh, uh, prominent job and lots of wealth and all that stuff to, to go on the road and basically died penniless. Okay. Because I, I know my third great grandfather is buried in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And oh. uh, they left, the family left Missouri oh. because they wouldn't accept slavery because of their religious background. And the regulators at that time in Missouri pushed them out. So they then went to Arkansas mm -hmm. and then later on to Texas. And I think the irony of that was uh, my great grandmother, really Eisenhower, lived on one spur of the Chisholm Trail and Denison is on another spur of the Chisholm Trail. Mm -hmm. So it's they were there at the same time. Very interesting. Huh. Right. Well, this, is, this is great to hear you, Jerry. Good to see oh. you too. <laughs> um, Eleanor, did you have another question? 
just going back to the religion question, that, that prayer that for the first inaugural was yes. written on a, a long yellow legal pad after he went to a communion service and between the communion service and the and the inauguration. And it's a beautiful prayer. It's in the National Presbyterian Church, uh, uh, sort of carved in, <laughs> in the chapel of the presidents now. Linda, do we have that piece of paper? I said, Sorry? Linda, Linda, do we have that piece of paper? I don't know, we'll have to look. There you go. It's one of our archivists. Yeah, our, our, our fifth grandchild. <laughs> Hi, sis. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Um, yeah, I believe that uh, a copy of that is hanging uh, in in uh, the burial uh, in the chapel. Yes, it is. Yeah, and um, actually, a couple of times I've been uh, given you know somebody would ask me to come and give the invocation at something, and uh, I I do either that one or the last paragraph of his um, farewell address. You know, he, he was a very spiritual person and um, he, he just so eloquently put things like that. That's beautiful. So we have two more questions in the chat that I'm gonna ask of you, uh, Mary Jean, and then that'll be the last comment because they, they're good wrap up questions. Um, okay. And then they'll go into, well, I'll wrap it on up. For, for the uh, day. So okay. uh, the first one is, I do know the answer to this. So I'm going to, I want you to share that. Do you have any plans for all your research on Ida? Perhaps a book. And then the other question is a general question about how growing up uh, with Ike changed your life. Um, specific things that changed you or your choices or influenced you or your choices. Okay, um, let's start with the easy one. Uh, uh, yes, there is a book in the works, but it, it got COVID held up. My brain just went to mush and I didn't work on it at all during COVID, but um, I'm back on it and excited and back in love with her and ready to tell her story. Um, uh, when I first walked into her birthplace, you know, the hair on the back of my neck just stood up and I said, this woman's got such a story and it just needs to be told. And I, I really feel like, you know, spiritually I'm the one to do it, but um, you know, if somebody, I don't know, anyway, if anybody ever decides to do it instead of me, I've got, you know, a room full of research, paper research, you are welcome to. <laughs> um, the other, um, I think, there was a lot of influence on my life, but not in the way that you would think. Um, you know, I, I didn't know any different, you know, I, I, I didn't know, I didn't look at granddad as um, the commander in chief or the Supreme allied commander or anything like that. He was, he was, my knee slapping grandfather had a great sense of humor, um, you know, loved horses, loved skeet shooting, um, that kind of thing. But I do believe that he um, very much influenced um, my values and um, my later choices after I quit being a stupid teenager and, you know, kind of... <laughs> um, by his example, because we always knew that he had an ironclad will and uh, he was a lot like his mother in that sense. And when it came time for like self-improvement or whatever, it, it got done. And even, even all the way to the end of his life, um, he um, said that, you know, he was on like, I think it, he had six massive heart attacks and in the seventh, the heart just stopped. Um, but he survived six. And the reason being kind of, uh, I think, is um, they did a lot of experimental work on him. And he, he said, you know, I've lived a good life. If research on my heart or, you know, experimental stuff on my heart can help somebody else, that's okay with me. So he was really giving um, to his last breath. And I think his last words were something like, if you won't let me go, God take me. 
um, you know, so it, um, he, he taught me how to, um, just by example, um, let other people have the glory if that's what's necessary, as long as the good thing's happening. Um, and you can, you can make it their idea, you know, if it's, even if it's your idea, you don't need the credit necessarily. It just needs to get done. You know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of benevolency and, and um, kindnesses. Uh, he was very, very thoughtful um, as far as how he treated others and remembering little things. Um, and he, he was very fair. You know, there were four of us and he made sure that all four of us um, had, uh, you know, equal attention or whatever you, you want to say, uh, except there is one thing I'll take exception to, and Andy, you might agree with me. He named Camp David after David. Um, uh, yeah, and he named the Sequoia after you. Right. And he named the Honey Fitz after Susie. But Mary, the motorboat you're the after me. The motorboat. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a little bit of a pecking order, but he made sure everybody was included. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jean. Um, thank you for your insight into Ida and for sharing it with us. I also want to thank Anne for jumping in. Uh, yeah. We really appreciate well, your a learning input. experience. I, I know very little about Ida, and so it was great fun for me. Thank you so much for coming thank in. I, it, it's, it was a thrill to have you here. Absolutely. Good to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. <laughs> Um, uh, I also want to thank Don for uh, being our moderator today. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of you for joining us. And if you'll just bear with us for just another moment or two as we give you a few announcements. Uh, first of all, our 2022 public programs are made possible by the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Cope Foundation. So thank you to them. And um, our upcoming programs. Once again, our, our topic for the year is the making of a leader. So everything that we'll do this year is about leadership and um, learning more about what it takes to be a leader and learning about Ike himself as a leader. Our first book talk is next month on February 8th, where we will talk about the five dysfunctions of a team <coughs> book. Um, and we will welcome Dr. Jean Chavez uh, with Humanities Can Kansas to talk about that book. We would appreciate it if you joined us, even if you haven't read the book. Still, we still have great conversations when people haven't read the book. And then our next program after that is our Lunch and Learn, which is February 25th. Well, we'll welcome Keila Harrison, who is a Mandela Washington Fellow at K-State in their leadership, in the Stanley Leadership, School of Leadership Studies. Um, and that is Thursday, February 24th at noon. And Keila will talk about her experiences um, being a leader and having to take that uh, back to her home. Um, and, and what that means for, for herself and her, her family. Um, so please join us. Um, we really, we're really excited about the programs that we're doing this year and we hope you're excited as well. Uh, yes, our Lunch and Learns will be online all this year. Um, and uh, even when we're able to do in person, we'll, we'll continue to do virtual programming as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And I hope to see you on February 8th and you guys have a wonderful day. Bye.